Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Adam Smith. I'm the director of the Rothermere American Institute, and it's a very great pleasure to welcome you all here and people watching online to the inaugural lecture by this year's John G. Weiner, Professor of American Government, Nazita Lajavadi. Before I introduce um, Professor Lajavadi, I want to acknowledge the extraordinary generosity of the late Rivington Wynant and Joan Wynant, who have endowed this visiting professorship in honor of John Gilbert Wynant, who was appointed ambassador to the Court of St. James by FDR in the midst of the Blitz. According to the author of a book about Americans in wartime London, Ambassador Wynant's warmth and compassion and his determination to stand with them and share their dangers was the first tangible sign for the British that America and its people really cared about what happened to them. He became a symbol of the best side of America. We're going to be hearing this evening, no doubt, about the best and possibly some of the worst sides of America. Um, we're very proud at the RAI to host a professorship named for Ambassador Wynant and proud too of the distinguished roster of political scientists who've held the chair since its creation. This year's lecturer, Professor Lajavadi of Michigan State University is one of the most brilliant of a rising generation of scholars working at the intersection of race and public opinion. Uh, by my count, she's published at least 15 articles in prestigious journals, including the American Political Science Review and the Journal of Politics, and is the author of four uh, books, most recently, Misinformed, What Americans Know About Social Groups and Why It Matters for Politics, which came out with Cambridge University Press last year. So it's my very great pleasure, very great pleasure, to invite Professor Lajavadi to deliver the 2022 John G. Wynant inaugural lecture in American government entitled The Politics of American Islamophobia. Welcome everyone. Thank you for spending your evening with me. Over the next hour, I will begin to introduce us all uh, into a journey about Islamophobia. We're gonna talk about how it manifests in the world and especially in the United States. I will spend the first half of the talk providing examples of Islamophobia in day-to-day -day politics that many of us are already familiar with, but I'm doing so in order to refresh our recollections about how Islamophobia has been deeply intertwined with politics in the Western world, especially as a response to the terrorist attacks on September 11th, 2001. While we may all have a general political understanding of the world and how Islamophobia might exist, this can actually lead to quite passive thinking about how deleterious Islamophobia is to this marginalized group in our political systems. In the second half of the talk, I will introduce my book, which moves past anecdotes and helps us move past this passive thinking. My book is the first to systematically study whether Islamophobia is meaningful in day-to-day -day politics for exclusion, and it shows that systematically Islamophobia is pervasive in a number of different political domains. Finally, since Islamophobia in general needs to move from inclusion, for, from exclusion to inclusion, I will present some research on the avenues that we can be taking in order to arrive at a more inclusive society uh, with Muslims in the Western world. And so with that preview, Let's get started. Okay, so Islam globally. Islam is the second largest religious grouping behind Christianity with an estimated 1.6 to 2.1 billion adherents globally. It is also the fastest growing religion in the world today with the Muslim population forecasted it to be increasing by 35% over the next 20 years. Nonetheless, Despite the large number of Muslim adherents worldwide, Islamophobia or anti-Muslim hostility is pervasive and it is global. In 2020, the UN Human Rights Council published a report on hate. In this report, it determined that hate speech towards Muslims is increasing, especially on social media. 
that report found that Muslim and Jewish communities in European countries, especially in Austria, Belgium, Denmark, Germany, Finland, France, Greece, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, and Georgia, are exposed to hate speech more and more every day. Importantly, this report noted that social media is also a tool for spreading hate against Muslims outside of the Western world. The report finds that social media platforms like Facebook are a key tool for the circulation of real and constructed hatred towards religious minorities, especially in India and Myanmar. As of September 2021, the following European countries have enacted the full or partial ban of the headscarf or burqa into law. Austria, France, Belgium, Denmark, Bulgaria, the Netherlands, Germany, Italy, Russia, Luxembourg, Switzerland, Norway, Sweden, Kosovo, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. This report has identified that attitudes and support for headscarves bans are one of the most important manifestations of Islamophobia today. Let's have a look at Europe. Today in Europe, Islamophobia is pervasive. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic, at the close of December 2021, a new report on European Islamophobia found that hate crimes against Muslims on the continent have, quote, worsened if not reached a tipping point, end quote, over the last two years. Islamophobia in Europe manifests in a number of ways, through individual attitudes and behaviors and policies and practices of different organizations and institutions. I'm going to give you several different examples, which vary, but they include the following. One, negative public attitudes and behaviors. Two, verbal or online threats of violence, vilification, and abuse. Three, the proposal and passage of policies or legislation that indirectly or directly disproportionately affect Muslims. De facto and taste-based discrimination in education, employment, housing, or access to goods and services. Five, problems that manifest with federal and local law enforcement, such as ethnic and religious profiling and police abuse. And six, public pronouncements by politicians that stigmatize Muslims as a group. I want to delve into an example that's a bit closer to the UK. Let's have a look at France. How does Islamophobia manifest next door? In France, you don't actually have to look very far to see evidence of Islamophobia. Currently, the French presidential race is explicitly confronting the fact that nearly two thirds of French people believe that white Christians are, quote, threatened with extinction by Muslim migration, end quote. Election polls currently place both Marine Le Pen and Eric Zemmour just behind Macron. And Zemmour, famously, is running on the idea of the Great Replacement, a theory put forward by Renaud Camus that argues Christian civilization is being intentionally replaced using Muslim immigration from Africa in a plot by global elites. This person has about 14% of the French polling support at the moment. No candidate has above 25%. Muslims are at the heart of the political discussion in France. Just last month in January 2021, the French Senate voted to ban girls and women from wearing the hijab while playing sports. And as CNN put it, France, quote, showed the world once again that when it comes to further politicizing, targeting, and policing European Muslim women, our clothing choices and our bodies, it is in a league of its own, end quote. This new law is so controversial that the Telegraph writes that the hijab ban can make a French sport a no-go zone for Muslim women. None of this is new, however. Beginning in 2004, France banned wearing religious symbols, including the hijab in schools. In 2010, France became the first country in Europe to impose a ban on the niqab in public spaces. Women caught wearing the niqab in public spaces faced a 150 euro fine and were arrested by the police. In 2021, there came another controversial new law that was actually proposed by Macron himself. This bill controversially extended the ban on women wearing headscarves in public roles to women who worked for pri private organizations that provided a public service. The government claimed that a minority of France's estimated 6 million Muslims were at risk of forming a, quote, counter society, and that this bill was designed to tackle the dangers of this Islamist separatism. So, as I noted earlier, however, Islamophobia is a global phenomenon. This is not unique to Europe. This is not unique to the United States. It doesn't just exist in the West. We can find traces of it all over the world. Examples are numerous. Take, for instance, the plight of the Uyghurs in China. Since 2017, at least 1 million Uyghurs have been imprisoned in internment camps where they are subject to forced sterilizations 
religious restrictions, ideological re-education, increased surveillance, and forced labor. Some have gone as far as to characterize China's treatment of Uyghurs as a genocide. In India, where 200 million Muslims reside, they are nonetheless a minority, and Islamophobia is pervasive there also. A police probe recently investigated influential Hindu religious leaders who called for violence and even ethnic cleansing through the arming of Hindus against Muslims in order to teach them lessons. And so as one expert put it, Islamic phobic acts are now occurring in India with a sickening regularity. And the humiliation of Muslims has become a regular part of the political landscape. So, global Islamophobia is pervasive, but where does it come from? Well, this is a compelling question and a very difficult one to answer. It's one that I believe Professor Khalid Beydoun has answered very well. Beydoun argues that two decades after the attacks of 9-11, the American war on terror is no longer just America's war. It has morphed and metastasized into a global crusade where governments near and far have adopted this grand theory that Muslims were a demographic threat and that Islam inspired extremism and radicalism. Beydoun argues that these other governments have launched their own crusades in the name of the war on terror, where they have melanged expressions of Muslim identity with terror. This baseline forms what is now widely known and understood as Islamophobia, a term that blankets Muslims worldwide under the cover of terror suspicion. Arguably, the war on terror has reduced a supremely diverse faith population of 2 billion people who are spread across six continents. These are 2 billion people who worship and look and live in dramatically different ways into a singular sinister caricature. And so with that, Let's have a look at the politics of American Islamophobia, where it all began. For some background, many US Muslims are actually newcomers to the United States. A Pew Research study uh, actually found that between 1992 and 2012, approximately 1.7 Muslims entered the US as legal permanent residents. Today, they estimate about 3.45 Muslims residing in the United States. That's about 1% of the American population. But Muslims have been here since the founding of the country. It would be a mistake to not acknowledge this. Our best estimates actually surmise that about 30% of enslaved Africans who were forcibly brought to the United States were of Muslim faith in the 1600s. So when we think about Muslims in the United States, we have to recognize that they have been in that country for 400 years. But current hostility towards Muslim Americans in the American socio-political context is quite high, and so it deserves special attention. While this is nothing new and Muslims have been portrayed at odds with a more democratic or elevated West, it is true that in the post 9-11 era and well before the Trump presidency, the U.S. has endorsed or overseen legislation, policies, and interventions that have affected the lives of Muslims, both foreign and domestic. There's many reasons to be concerned about the status of Muslims in the years since 9-11. And for brevity, I'm going to provide three examples just to refresh our recollection. First, let's begin with Widespread, widespread surveillance programs and prolonged detentions. These programs began with the Bush administration, but they extended throughout the Obama presidency as well. Trust in institutions typically um, among minority communities in the United States is very low. And this is no different for the Muslim community, which has long had a strange relationship with law enforcement even before 2001. But in the aftermath of 9-11, the relationship between law enforcement and the Muslim community only worsened. Surveillance programs were pervasive and they manifested in vastly different ways. But I want to draw your attention to one that I believe is the most insidious. The New York Police Department launched a program where plainclothes police officers would be dispatched to Muslim neighborhoods and mosques to eavesdrop on conversations and build detailed files on where individuals ate, prayed, shopped, the NYPD's own published work on the surveillance program demonstrates that law enforcement conflated the real world practice of counter radicalization from the behaviors of millions of faithful Muslims who lead very ordinary, trust me, very ordinary, very boring lives. 
common markers of religiosity, like having a beard or just being more involved in social activism that was led by your community, or giving up drinking or not smoking, these were viewed as typical signatures of latent Islamic extremism. And the NYPD's surveillance program was so intrusive that they even went past their own legal jurisdiction to spy on college kids in another state at Yale, at the Muslim Student Association. This should really raise the alarm. Yale students are among the most integrated and elite people in America, which also means that they're among the most elite Muslims in America. And a law enforcement agency from another state was spying on them. The NYPD actually sent undercover agents to join these students on a whitewater rafting trip where they took detailed notes and on the students and on their activities on this trip. Well, let's look at another example. As the 2016 presidential campaign season and the first year of the Trump presidency unfolded, American Muslims found that they were no longer facing microaggressions, but were actually experiencing a heightened risk of physical harm, and they were subject increasingly to anti-Muslim legislation. A second reason we should be extremely concerned about the status of Muslims uh, in recent years is that hate crimes against them have soared. The Council on American Islamic Relations, or CARE, is the nation's largest Muslim civil rights organization, and they collect a lot of data on hate crimes, and they're the most trusted source to measure hate crimes against Muslims. They released a quarterly report demonstrating that the number of hate crimes against U.S. Muslims in the first half of 2017 had spiked by 91% compared to the same period in 2016, which was the most egregious uh, period to date for them. This is particularly striking because 2016 was the worst year. Moreover, across the country, anti-Sharia bills are being introduced in state legislatures. These bills prohibit US courts from applying state courts from considering foreign international or religious law, like Sharia law and its decision-making. But this is futile because these laws are symbolic more than anything else. In the United States, we have the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, which mandates that no religious tradition can be established as the basis of laws that apply to everyone, including any form of Sharia. Strikingly, from 2010 to 2017, 201 anti-Sharia laws were proposed across 43 states, and 14 were actually enacted in Arizona, Arkansas, Florida, Kansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Tennessee, and Texas. And over this period of time, Texas and Mississippi actually each introduced 20 different versions of this law into their state legislatures. Finally, uh, we all remember this, but of course there was the Muslim ban, a policy that Trump first proposed in December 2015 after the San Bernardino attacks. Not one full week into his presidency, Donald Trump followed through on a campaign promise and signed Executive Order 13769 into law on January 27, 2017. This executive order denied citizens of seven Muslim majority countries entry into the United States. It was followed by two more versions of the ban in March 2017 and again in September 2017. Surprisingly, there was a glimmer of hope for Muslim Americans in the aftermath of the 2016 election public opposition to the ban was actually quite high. In fact, tens of thousands of protesters descended upon airports and landmarks around the country, and they chanted slogans like, no hate, no fear, refugees are welcome here. These protests also spread to European cities such as London, Manchester, and Berlin, where thousands shared their support. Solidarity against the ban also manifested when 350,000 individuals donated $24 million to the ACLU in just a 24-hour period. Leading politicians from both parties also delivered public and critical responses against the ban, painting it as un-American and at odds with American norms of egalitarianism and religious freedom. Nonetheless, however, in 2018, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the Muslim ban in Trump versus Hawaii. And this ban remained in effect throughout the entire Trump presidency until Biden assumed office in January 2021. Okay. So these examples are probably familiar to most of us. And the truth is that many, if not most of us, have a general political understanding of the world and how Islamophobia might exist in it. 
but actually this collective understanding might actually lead to some really, really passive thinking about how deleterious Islamophobia is for Muslims in the political system. And in the decade and a half after 9-11, very little research has quantitatively, systematically evaluated how anti-Muslim animus systematically manifests in American politics. My book, Outsiders at Home, The Politics of American Islamophobia, conducts a comprehensive study of how US Muslims are treated in a number of different domains that are arguably vital to the democratic inclusion of this group of people and it examines empirically how they fare in American democracy. My book asks, how do Muslim Americans fare in American democracy? But answering this question is very complex because of course it's very broad and it requires a multifaceted approach. The totality of the evidence in this book provides empirical evidence of the de degenerating situation of Muslim Americans. In fact, this book finds that the group situation is far worse than previously imagined. I'm going to provide an outline to the book's questions now. The book begins first by evaluating public opinion. It asks, how does Muslim identity, sorry, how does anti-Muslim hostility matter for shaping candidate and policy support? So how do negative attitudes about Muslims matter for shaping Trump support? How do they matter for shaping support for the Muslim ban, for instance? Next, I take a stab at evaluating how Muslims are served by their political representatives. I have asked, how do Muslims fare in terms of substantive representation? Are they ignored by their elected representatives when they seek a constituent service? Third, I examine portrayals in the news media. I use it as a lens to first evaluate how Muslims have been discussed over a 20 year period compared to other marginalized groups. And then I evaluate whether portrayals of Muslims matter for shaping public attitudes. I also evaluate whether Muslims have a chance at getting their descriptive representatives elected by evaluating whether Americans are willing to, to vote for Muslim candidates. And finally, in the book, I evaluate US Muslims' experiences themselves. I look at the, the rates of sociopolitical discrimination and I evaluate whether these matter for whether Muslims want to be more visible or less visible in the sociopolitical context. To preview some answers. <coughs> First, I develop a scale called the Muslim American Resentment Scale. This scale consists of nine survey items. They pose questions to ordinary Americans about different stereotypes, and they measure how much people agree or disagree with these statements. I then conduct 10 different surveys on nationally representative samples of Americans, and I evaluate the extent to which anti-Muslim hostility matters for shaping Trump support, for shaping and also for shaping policy support that's hostile to Muslim Americans. Across numerous surveys, I find consistently that Muslim American resentment or anti-Muslim hostility was the single most important predictor of Trump support apart from party ID. That is to say, after your partisan identity, which is rooted in us and we're socialized into from a very, very young age, the most important factor that mattered for the 2016 presidential election in the United States was anti-Muslim hostility. And this book shows this in 10 different surveys. It also shows that anti-Muslim hostility matters for a number of different issues as well, policy issues. It matters for banning Muslims from the United States. It also matters for, with, uh, for restricting their um, ability to buy weapons. And it also matters for support for increasingly policing their neighborhoods. Next, I conduct two experiments on state legislators. Essentially, I conduct audit studies. These are experiments in which I pretend to be fictitious people, and I write legislators across the United States, and I ask for a, a, a service, a constituent service. So 
specifically what I did is I impersonated either a white man from an elite school like Harvard or a white man from a less elite school like a community college or a Muslim man from Harvard or a Muslim man from a community college. And I wrote state legislators emails asking for an application to be an intern in their office for the summer, which is what people do all the time. <laughs> Um, and it's a great way, uh, actually, internships are a really great way to access the political system, right? For anybody who really wants to get a leg up and learn about the political system, doing an internship exposes you to the day-to-day -day life of politics. It can really get you socialized into that sphere. Interestingly, I find two really striking findings. The first is that higher education does not help Muslims. More integration and socioeconomic status does not enable them to acquire a political internship. Strikingly, no matter how you slice and dice it, Muslims, no matter their socioeconomic status, were significantly less likely to get a call back for an internship. The flip side of that is that the white person writing for an application for the internship actually no matter whether they were at Harvard or from a community college, they always got a callback at the same rate. So low socioeconomic status didn't hinder the white applicant from getting, from getting a callback. That should be really, really striking for us. If we think that being integrated into networks like Harvard is really going to advance us into politics, we should really think twice about that. The second really striking finding from these experiments was that Democrats were no more likely than Republicans to be responsive to the Muslim constituent. So if we think that Democrats are going to be Muslims' most likeliest allies in the current political arena as it looks, it's just simply not true. They're not being served by their democratically elected representatives. In fact, Democrats ignored Muslims just as often as Republicans did. They didn't serve the white respondents more, as much as the Republicans did, but they did ignore Muslims as much. I conducted a second experiment. I took all of those lessons and I thought, okay, well, what if it's different if you're pretending to be a student versus if you're pretending to be an imam or a priest? So I conducted a second study. I conducted a second study, and this time I asked for a minute of the legislator's time. I impersonated a pastor or an imam. It went through ethical approval, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> and I asked for a meeting with the representative in states where Muslims were a larger proportion of the population. And what I found again is that actually Democrats continue to ignore the Muslim uh, imam. Strikingly, however, Republicans were interested. They were interested and they were willing to take a call back with, with, the, with the imam at the same rate as they were with pastors. And so this raises a few questions. Are Democrats just bad at serving their constituents? Maybe, maybe, right? Maybe they have a staffing problem. But maybe also they don't find Muslim constituents to be integral into the coalition that they need to build in order to win elections. And that's something to think about with these two studies. But substantively, I find that Muslims are not being served by their elected representatives. Next, I conduct a study on the news media. The news media is a really interesting branch <laughs> to study. Some say it's actually the fourth branch of government in the United States. I'm sure many of you know that in the world before social media, Many of us got our information from cable news. Before that, we had newspapers, surprisingly. And so I turned to the cable news media over a 20 year period of time when folks were actually turning to cable news for information. I turned to it for two reasons. The first is very, very little research has looked at American Muslims. In fact, the first public opinion survey to come out about Muslims, Islam, or Muslim Americans in the United States wasn't until after 9-11. And so we don't actually have very many ways of measuring anything pre-9-11 with respect to how Muslims fared for that period of time. And so I turned to the cable news media first as a 
lens, shall we say, into how Muslims were being portrayed to the American public over a 20 year period of time and how that might compare to other minoritized groups who we know actually have really, really poor um, portrayals. In fact, we know that for instance, Latinos and African-Americans are often associated with a quote, crime news script, unquote. So it was interesting to me it, to begin with just to see how Muslims might be portrayed differently or similarly to these other out groups. And then secondly, I turned to the cable news media in order to evaluate whether exposure to positive or negative, um, excuse me, positive or negative portrayals about Muslims foreign or Muslims domestic might actually generate negative attitudes towards American Muslims. So for two different reasons, I hand collected every single broadcast that ever aired on Fox, MSNBC, and CNN from 1996 to the end of 2016. This was a very difficult task for my hands, but it was a very important task because I had the universe of anything that Americans might have seen. And from there, I conducted textual analysis and I gauged the volume of coverage and then the sentiment of coverage. And I found that American Muslims entered the national consciousness, of course, in 2001, that they reemerged after the Obama presidency and they really peaked in 2015 and 2016. In fact, in 2016, Muslims made up one third of all cable news coverage on CNN. They made up 40%, they were mentioned in 40% of all news coverage on MSNBC in 2016. On Fox, they made just under 30%. And this rivaled other groups like Latinos and African Americans, especially African, African Americans, which is striking because their population size is so much smaller than that of those other two outgroups. I then conduct a number of different experiments and I find that exposure to negative, uh, negative transcripts, negative broadcasts about American Muslims and Muslims foreign, not only do they generate negative attitudes and more hostility towards Muslims, but they actually generate attitudes that are very hostile in terms of policy support towards Muslims. And so I think this, this, this section of the book really points to the fact that the news media really is operating as another way where we can see where exclusion might be happening for, for American Muslims. Next, I conduct two studies for the prospects of descriptive representation. For those of you who are unfamiliar with political science, one way we say that you can really experience representation is if people like you and the groups that you belong to represent you. So in order to actually get a descriptive representative, in order to actually have, <clears throat> in order to actually have somebody who looks like you in office, public support for them needs to be high enough. And what I find in two different studies where I randomize the race and the partisanship of a Muslim candidate where they are either uh, Arab looking, white looking or black looking, I find that across the board, race does not matter for uh, prospects for a Muslim candidate being elected, but partisanship does. People are incredibly happy to elect a Muslim representative if they are a Republican. They do not wanna uh, elect a Muslim representative who is a Democrat. And so because most Muslims who run for office are going to be Democrats, and it's probably less likely they will, they will run for Republican, uh, for the Republican, under the Republican Party, it, it, it sort of shows that there's going to be a low probability of descriptive representation happening anytime soon. And finally, the book turns to the experiences of US Muslims themselves. Um, here, I did some qualitative interviews. Uh, I interviewed about 200 Muslims and I asked them in the aftermath of the Muslim ban, how do you feel when that people took to the streets and that they protested in your favor? And what has that made you do in consequence in terms of being more visible um, outside and going to public places or retreating from public places? And the responses were quite stark. Most people felt that even though there was this show of support, they felt actually very harmed by their visibility. Um, one person went so far as to tell me that they were going to die. Um, and they, they really meant it. 
you know, they, they really meant that we think we are going to die with this kind of attention on us. It must be so dire that our lives must really be at stake. And so what I found was that not only was there a high level of feeling of feelings of societal and institutional discrimination, but that many were concerned about their visibility and had actually retreated from public spaces. So where are we at? Well, like I said, when I first previewed the book, it seems like the totality of the evidence suggests that there is a degenerating situation of American Muslims. And perhaps we might even argue that the group situation is, is a bit worse than we might have previously imagined. And the reality is that the discrimination that's out there and the exclusion that's out there has not gone unnoticed. In fact, it has had consequences. consequences. Muslim Americans know that they are deprived of fair treatment in the socio-political context. And they are acutely aware of their worsening position in the political arena. And the totality of these results, I argue, indicates that Muslim Americans experience substantial hostility and discrimination in American politics. Okay, that's really depressing. So what can we do? <laughs> well, I wouldn't want to leave you on a sour note. So having established, of course, that Muslims are systematically excluded in politics. I think it begs the question, well, how can we foster political inclusion? Anecdotally, we can see that having representatives who identify as Muslim, like Ilhan Omar or Rashida Tlaib, they help to descriptively represent Muslims and they help to bring Muslims into the American political conversation and provide visibility, which is really great. Um, but there's other ways too. We also, so I, I'm gonna sort of draw on science here. Research tells us that people who are members of marginalized groups can actually become politically empowered when the political system signals inclusiveness. And currently I received a grant with two colleagues from the Swedish Research Council to study whether we can empower minorities. So visible minorities, visible immigrants in Sweden and Muslims in America to see if we can visibly, uh, if we can empower these visible minorities into political leadership roles, into feelings of belonging into the political arena, and into political behaviors. We're really interested. How can we take these really, really deeply upsetting um, realities that we can see in all this research? How can we turn it around? You know, what can we do about it? How can we be proactive about it? So with these two colleagues, uh, we developed funding and we developed so we got funding, we developed short videos. We decided that moving forward, instead of just pretending like people are exposed to campaign material, let's make campaign material. So we worked with cartoon developers and we developed short videos that last about 50 seconds. And they describe a life in a city council member, a day in the life in the city council member's life, essentially. And these videos incrementally change. So we have seven different versions of the video. And they move from being an all white, all male city council with 20 representatives to an incredibly diverse, ethnically diverse and uh, diverse in terms of gender political assembly. And we randomized people into different versions of these videos in Sweden and in the United States. So we're incrementally varying skin color. We're changing religious garb. We're changing clothing. We're changing hair. We're changing skin. We're doing all sorts of things to signify gender, religion, uh, ethnicity, inclusiveness. So before I conclude, I actually wanna show one of these videos to you so you can get an idea of what type, types of materials we're, we're creating. Okay.
so fun fact, we found them because they used to make depression videos. <laughs> uh, we thought, well, they know how to cheer people up. <laughs> That's our goal here, so great. So we developed seven of these videos. We randomized people into watching them. As you can tell, they're kind of soft. The music is very quiet. It's really just giving you facts that you probably already knew. So what we're really hoping here is that people just can see these really low key signals of change in the makeup of the representatives. And I kind of want to conclude with this finding. We learned a lot. We found positive results. We find that upon viewing more inclusive videos that include visible markers of Muslims and minorities and women, our videos actually empower these very people to become mobilized into politics. They took action and wrote legislators. They signaled that they want more information to run for office themselves. And they indicated that they feel that they belong more in the American political system. And I want to conclude on this point. It is not all gloom and doom. We have ways to combat Islamophobia in politics. And I believe it begins with inclusion. And with that, I thank you all.